yeah yeah very good afternoon and uh, a warm welcome to all to the fourth day of uh, this webinar series uh, from pg and uh, research department of mathematics so i welcome you all and uh, uh, we will have a wonderful session today uh, before we start our session uh, let us uh, do our prayer with uh, tamil thai walthu and the college prayer so let us begin with uh, college neerarum kadaludutta nilamadangu kelidolugum seerarum adanam enathigal varadu kandami ekkalamum adisiranda thaavidanal tirunaalum takkasiru pirayudalum talithanarum tilagamune அத்திலக வாசனை போல் அனைத்துலகும் இன்பமுற எத்தி செய்யும் புகழ் மணக்க இருந்த பெரும் தமிழனங்கே தமிழனங்கே உன் சீரிழமை திறம் மிகுந்து செயல் மறந்த வாழ்த்ததுமே வாழ்த்ததுமே சோரதம் சத்தியபரம் திரிசத்தியம் சத்தியோனிம் நிதம் சத்தியம் ருதசத்தியேத்ரம் சத்தியாத்மக்கம் தாம் சரணம் பிரபன்ன கர்மசு மனஸ்தவாதோர்ணிவாசிரஸ்தவிஸ்தாம் தர்சனேஸ்துவத்தமோவே தஸ்மையீஷ்ணாத்தமேனேன Yes, yeah, warm welcome once again. Um, I would like to first of all welcome our uh, Honorable Secretary, Shri Ashok Kumar Mundra Ji. our beloved principal santosh babu sir and our uh, uh, hod and convener of this uh, webinar series dr uh, r venkatramanan and uh, uh, i also welcome uh, today's uh, speaker dr sp vijay lakshmi and uh, beloved students and the participants uh, from all over tamil nadu um, well today's uh, topic we are going to uh, see a wonderful lecture on introduction to geometric function theory uh by dr sp vijay lakshmi to introduce uh, madam uh, she completed her uh, doctorate from bharathiar university in the topic of uh, geometric function theory uh, she has completed uh, uh, her slet exam from bharathiar university she also completed her from uh, m phil and msc from meenakshi college chennai uh, to her credit uh, she she guided uh, six m phil students and uh, uh, she has uh, 14 years of teaching experience um, and also she presented many papers in conferences and also published uh, many renowned uh, um, articles in uh, um, uh, international journals and national journals and uh, today uh, she is going to talk about uh, uh, the introduction to geometric function theory and uh, let me welcome madam uh, and uh, uh, start her lecture on the uh, the beautiful topic on geometric function theory welcome madam please uh, uh, the dais is yours please go ahead 
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our Honorable Secretary, Shri Ashokumar Muntraji, and our Principal, Dr. S. Santosh Babu, and our HOD, Dr. Venkat Ramanan, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you all. OK, first, uh, let me start the session. So uh, in today's session, we are going to see about the introduction to geometric function theory. So uh, here, these are the overview of the uh, thing which I'm going to cover in this session. So the prerequisites, that is the basic uh, definitions, and then the Riemann mapping theorem, analytic univalent functions, and some subclasses of uh, the class S, star-like and convex function, and uh, some introduction about subordination, Hankel determinant, and then the recent trends. So those are the topics which I like to cover in this session. So first, uh, what is a geometric function theory? So actually, with the history dating back uh, to the 18th century, the complex analysis is a broad and uh, textured subject with application not only to the other parts of analysis, but also to the areas of mathematics and science in general. So the two important branches of uh, complex analysis are the theory of conformal uh, representation and the geometric function theory. So this geometric function theory, uh, it deals with the geometric properties of the analytic function. So this uh, has born uh, around in the turn of the 20th century and yet it uh, remains at a active field of uh, research. So first we will start with a basic one. So first, what is the domain? So a domain is nothing but an open connected set in the complex plane. So any open connected set in the complex plane is nothing but the domain. So in the domain, we know a simply connected domain and then the multiply connected domain. So we say that the domain is simply connected if the complement is connected. So if the complement of the domain is connected, then we can say that it is a simply connected domain, not otherwise. So that is, it should be contracted to a single point. Suppose if you consider the domain A, so this will be, uh, that is, you can compress this to a single point. So we can say that this A is a simply connected domain. Whereas if you consider this B, so in the B, we have some holes in between. So if, if we cannot compress this to a single point, rather the complement is not connected in the set B. So you can say that uh, this is a multiply uh, connected region. So B is nothing but the multiple connected region and A is a simply connected region. So the simply connected region means its complement should be a connected one. So the next one is a single valued function. So when will you say that the function is a single valued? That is, if there exists only one value for the function. So then the function will be said to be a single valued function. Otherwise, it is uh, nothing but the multiple valued function or you can say multi-valued function. For example, if you consider this f of z equal to z squared. So for z equal to 2, what will be the function value? So f of z will be 4. So only one value exists, right? So f of z equal to z squared is nothing but the single valued function. Rather, if you take f of z equal to root z, so at z equal to 4, we will be getting f of z equal to plus or minus 2. That is two values. Root 4 is plus or minus 2. So we can say that this f of z equal to root z is a multi-valued function. So the next one is differentiability. So the differentiability means that is if the function is differentiable at all points in the region, then you can say that it is a, that is the function is said to be differentiable in that region. That is a function should be differentiable at all points in the region. Suppose if you consider a region like this. So in the region, in all the points, the function should be differentiable. So then we can say that it is differentiable in that region. So analytic at a point. If a function is differentiable at all points in some neighborhood of the point. Suppose if z0 is a point and uh, this is a neighborhood. So this is a neighborhood of z0. Then we say that if the function is differentiable in the neighborhood of uh, this point, then we can say that it is analytic at the point z0. Suppose if it is analytic in the entire region, then you can say that it is analytic in that region. So uh, if the re that is if the function is analytic at all points of the region, so then we can say that the function is analytic in that region. For example, suppose if you consider f of z equal to 1 by say some z minus 2. So this is some function. So here, this function will be continuous. That, uh, that is, it, this will be different analytic except at z equal to 2. That is, except at z equal to 2, 
the function will be analytic at all other points. So this is an example of the analytic function. So now uh, moving on to the univalent function. Let us suppose if you consider a function f of z in a domain, say some uh, mod z less than r. So consider a function f of z in the domain mod z less than r. And we say that this is a p-valent or a multivalued function, multivalent function, if no values of the function is taken more than p times, more than p times in this disk. And that is at least one value uh, must be taken exactly p times. Then we can say that this is p-valent function. So if p equal to 1, then we say that it is a univalent function. So a function f from the domain D to the complex domain C is called the univalent on D if f of z1 is not equal to f of z2 for all z1 and z2 belongs to D with z1 not equal to z2. That is whenever z1 not equal to z2, f of z1 is not equal to f of z2. And similarly, if f z1 is equal to z2, then f of z1 should be equal to f of z2. Right? So this is a one-to-one -one, uh, function. So from D to the complex domain. So that is nothing but the univalent function on the domain D. So locally, the that is a function will be said to uh, is said to be a locally univalent at a point if it is univalent in some neighborhood. So in the neighborhood, if the function is univalent, then we can say that it is locally univalent. So if the function is univalent, then automatically it implies the locally univalent. But the converse need not be true. That is, if the function is locally univalent, uh, need not implies the univalent of that function. So for that, we will consider this example. So let us consider the domain D, uh, z from, that is, mod z lies between 1 to 2, and the argument uh, lies between 0 and 5 by 2. So consider the function f from D to C, f of z equal to z squared. So we can very well see that this function is locally univalent at the point z0. Because f dash of z, f dash of z is 2z. So at the point z0, if you consider f dash of z0 is 2z0, which is not equal to 0. So this uh, function is uh, locally univalent. That is in the neighborhood of the point z0, the function is univalent. So but we will check whether it is univalent or not. So univalent uh, fun condition is, let us consider z1 and z2 to be the two points. Let us consider z1 to be, say, some 3 by 2 root 2 plus 2 divided by 2 root 2 i. So this is your z1 and z2. z2 is nothing but uh, minus 3 by 2 root 2 and minus 2 divided by 2 root 2 into i. So this is uh, z2, right? So z1 and z2 are two different points. So here z1 is not equal to z2, right? z1 is not equal to z2. But uh, f of z1 and f of z2, that is if you substitute, you will be getting 9 by 4, right? So f of z1 is same as f of z2, whereas z1 is not equal to z2. So you cannot say that this function is univalent in this region, right? But it is locally univalent, but it is not univalent. So from this example, we can say that the univalent will imply the locally univalent, but the converse need not be true. So we say that if the function is analytic and univalent, then we can say that it is a conformal mapping. So before that, what is the definition of the conformal mapping? We say that uh, the transformation is conformal if it preserves the angle between the oriented curves, that is both in magnitude as well as in the direction. So the condition is if the function is analytic in the region, and if f dash of z is not equal to 0, that is the derivative is not equal to 0 in the D, in the domain D, then we say that the mapping is conformal. So if you consider the transformation omega equal to z squared, so this maps, uh, that is a rectangular grid onto the hyperbolas. So here it preserves the angle between them, right? But at the point uh, origin, that is if you take z equal to 0 in that uh, point, the mapping is not conformal, but it is conformal at all other points because f dash of 0, right? So f dash of z will be 2z. So at the point uh, z equal to 0, we will be getting f dash of 0 equal to 0. So at the, at the origin, it is not conformal, but it is conformal at all other points. So we say that an analytic and univalent function is called the conformal mapping. So if the function is analytic and univalent, then we can say that it is a conformal mapping. So now let us uh, define the class of analytic univalent function. Suppose if you consider 
a to be the class of the function of the form f of z equal to z plus summation a n z par n where n ranges from 2 to infinity. So this is a Taylor series. So which are analytic in the open unit disk and normalized by the condition f of 0 equal to 0 and f dash of 0 equal to 1. So now we are going to consider uh, the this class of this form. So this is denoted by a. Okay, a is, uh, that is the class of analytic function. So we are normalizing this by the condition f of 0 equal to 0 and f dash of 0 equal to 1. And the subclass of all A which are univalent is denoted by F. So S is nothing but the class of all analytic and univalent function. So A is nothing but the class of analytic function where S is the class of all analytic as well as the univalent function is denoted by the class S in the unit disk. Okay. So here is a famous mathematician uh, Riemann. So uh, he was a German mathematician who made the contribution to analysis, number theory, and uh, differential geometry. So uh, he is mostly known for the uh, first uh, rigorous formulation of the integral, Riemann integral, and his work on Fourier series. So his con uh, contribution to the um, complex analysis include most notably the introduction of the Riemann surfaces, uh, which break a new ground in natural geometric treatment in the complex analysis. So this is a most important theorem which we'll be using here. So the Riemann mapping theorem. So it states that if D is a simply connected domain and it is a proper subset of the complex plane, and if zeta is any point in D, then there exists a unique function which maps D conformally onto the unit disk. So with the property f of zeta equal to zero and f dash of zeta greater than zero in the unit disk. So E is nothing but the unit disk mod z less than one. Actually, this uh, Riemann mapping theorem, uh, it's very useful in translating any simply connected domain to the unit disk so that the problem can be easily solved. So this is any simply connected domain. So in the z-plane, we have any simply connected domain. So we can transform this any simply connected domain to the unit disk so that it can be easily um, solvable. Right. So this is a Riemann mapping uh, theorem. So the main application, uh, this is almost applied in uh, many fields, even in the image processing. So we can come, uh, we can convert any simply connected domain to a uh, unit disk, and then we can have the one-to-one -one correspondence between the simply connected domain to the unit disk. So it is applied in almost all the fields. So in 1851, actually, uh, Riemann initiated this uh, theory, that is any simply connected domain can be transformed to the unit disk. So this theorem asserts that any univalent function uh, in D associated with the open disk and the properties of the univalent function defined in the open disk can be easily translated to the properties of the original function, which is in the simply connected domain. So in this uh, Riemann mapping theorem, we shall consider the class S. So S is nothing but the analytic univalent function uh, normalized by the condition f of 0 equal to 0 and f dash of 0 equal to 1. So why we are using this normalization? So actually, the normalization is made uh, to simplify the function, to simplify the function uh, in eliminating the irrelevant constants. For example, see, g of z can be written as f of z minus f of 0 by f dash of 0 for the normalization, right? So what is the normalization? That is f of 0 equal to 0 and f dash of 0 equal to 1, right? So here, uh, we can see that this g is nothing but f of z minus f of 0 divided by f dash of 0. That is first we are translating the image domain by the vector f of 0 and then we are dilating by the factor f dash of 0 and then rotating through the angle. Right. So actually the class S is preserved by all the things that is uh, uh, dilation, rotation, magnification, etc. So we are uh, we can choose like this. That is g of z can be written like this. Right. So this normalization is only uh, made to simplify the function thereby eliminating the irrelevant constants so as to simplify the problem. So this class is preserved under the number of transformation. So first one is conjugation. So if f belongs to the class S, yes, then g of z, which is nothing but f of z bar, the whole conjugate. Then you can say that g also belongs to S. Yes. For example, see if f of z, if you consider f of z is nothing but z plus a2 z squared, plus a3z cube plus etc 
so f of z bar the whole bar so g of z will be nothing but z plus a2 bar z squared plus a3 bar z cube and so on so you can easily say that this also belongs to the class s so similarly the rotation so if f belongs to s then g of z which is nothing but e power minus i theta f of e power minus e power plus i theta of z then you can say that this g belongs to the class s and similarly the disk automorphism so if g of z equal to f of z plus a by 1 plus a bar z minus f of a and divided by 1 minus mod a squared f dash of a so uh, even if you consider this you can say that g belongs to s so it preserves the disk automorphisms and then the square root transformation so the square root is g of z equal to root of uh, f of z the whole square so in this case you can say that g of z the whole square will be equal to f of z square right so in the f of z square you will be getting only the even function right and then uh, this g of z square so in the g of z square you will be getting f of z square so uh, uh, even if you simplify this you can say that g belongs to s yes. so it also preserves the square root transformation so this are some of the examples in the class s yes. that is the identity map so f of z equal to z and then the mobius transformation and then the function defined by half log of 1 plus z by 1 minus z and then the very interesting uh, cobe function which is nothing but z divided by 1 minus z the whole square so uh, all these things are the examples of the class is so if you consider the two univalent functions so far we have studied that the univalent function uh, preserves this uh, uh, transformation that is conjugation rotation disk automorphism and then the square root transformation so uh, but the, if you consider the two univalent function then the sum of two univalent function need not be a univalent function so for example if you consider f of z equal to z divided by 1 minus z and g of z equal to z divided by 1 plus i z so here we can say that both f and g belongs to the class s but uh, f plus g will not belongs to the class s because if you consider the derivative that is uh, just consider half of uh, f dash of z plus g dash of z so if you uh, differentiate this two function and simplify we will be getting 1 minus of 1 minus i z divided by 1 minus z squared into 1 plus i z the whole square so if you substitute that is at the point 1 by 1 minus i if you take the conjugate you will be getting 1 plus i by 2 so at the point z equal to 1 plus i by 2 this function will be equal to 0 right so that is the derivative is equal to 0 therefore you can say that the f plus g is not injective that is that uh, that is it, that does not exist a one to one correspondence right therefore you can say that f plus g is not a univalent function though f and g are a univalent function f plus g is not a univalent function so he is another famous uh, mathematician paul cobe he was a 20th century german mathematician so his work uh, mainly uh, dealt exclusively with the complex numbers so the well known class that is uh, k of z equal to z divided by 1 minus z the whole square k of z equal to z divided by 1 minus z the whole square so this serves as a extremal function for many of the subclasses in the univalent function so it maps a unit disk on to the uh, entire complex plane except the slit that we can uh, see in the uh, image so this is actually the unit disk so uh, here k of z is nothing but z divided by 1 minus z the whole square so this maps the entire unit disk into the uh, entire complex plane except the slit from minus infinity to minus 1 by 4 minus infinity to minus 1 by 4 that is you can see that uh, this unit disk is mapped to the entire real plane so the real plane is uh, real part of uh, the omega greater than 0 so it maps to the entire real plane and then we are squaring so the squaring means it maps to the entire plane uh, except the non positive real axis let us see except the non positive real axis because here we are squaring so it will map to the entire plane except the non positive uh, real non positive real axis right and then we have the dilation because this can be written as like this 1 by 4 into 1 plus z by 1 minus z the whole square minus 1 so we have the dilation so here 1 by 4 into z minus 1 so this part so except this part it maps the entire uh, that is unit disk 
onto the entire complex plane except the slit from minus infinity to minus 1 by 4. Right? Because the function can be written like this. That is 1 by 4 into 1 plus z by 1 minus z the whole square minus 1 by 4. So this is a Kobe function. So actually this serves as an extremal function for many of the uh, classes in S. So the next we'll move to the Biberbach uh, theorem. So before going into that theorem, we will see about the mathematician. So he was a little bit uh, Biberbach, he was a German mathematician. So actually in 1916, he formulated the conjecture, stating that the condition for the analytic function to map the open unit disk uh, injectively into the complex plane in terms of the functions of the Taylor series. So that is, uh, you, have, you have to consider the function like this, f of z equal to z plus a2 z squared plus a3 z cube plus etc. So actually the Bible back conjecture is, he proposed that is a coefficient, that is a1, a2, a3, etc. a n is less than or equal to n. So this is the conjecture, actually he formulated the conjecture, but it was proved uh, only in 1985. So this is a Bible back theorem. Actually, he has given that uh, theorem for the first coefficient, that is a2. a2 is less than or equal to 2. So on the equality holds only if it is the rotation of uh, Kobe function. So if the f belongs to the class S, then the coefficient, that is the first coefficient, a2 is less than or equal to 2. So this was a Bible back theorem. So the conjecture is uh, mod a n is less than or equal to n for n equal to 2, 2. 2, 3, etc. So the equality will be occurring only for the rotation of the Kobe function. So this conjecture was uh, remained unsolved till 1985 and it was uh, proved by the D branches by means of the uh, method of loner chain. So the significant, uh, the, actually this uh, Biberbach theorem uh, of the univalent function uh, was first proposed by 1926 uh, by Biberbach. And uh, this theorem is one of the uh, most important in this field. So the next we will discuss about the growth and the distortion theorem. So actually the idea of the growth of the analytic function refer to the size of the domain f of z. And the distortion theorem is about the size of uh, f dash of z. So if the function f belongs to the class s, then we say that the mod f of z, that slice between r by 1 plus r the whole squared and r by 1 minus r the whole squared for r less than 1 that is in the unit disk and the distortion theorem so this goes for f dash of z so the f dash of z lies between 1 minus r by 1 plus r the whole cube to 1 plus r by 1 minus r the whole cube and uh, the equality will be occurring only for uh, the function if it is a rotation of the Kobe function so next we will move to the star like function so we say that uh, a domain is said to be the star-like if you have the, any linear segment joining 0 to uh, any other point lies in, lie entirely in D, then we can say that it is a star-like uh, domain. So the function f belongs to A is said to be a star-like in the open unit disk and f of e is nothing but the star-like domain. So uh, function is star-like if and only if this condition is satisfied, that is a real part of z f dash of z by f of z is greater than 0 for all z belongs to the unit disk. So then we say that it is a star-like function. So actually the geometrical interpretation for this uh, star-like is that is for any fixed r that is from 0 to 1, the functional that is the argument r e power i theta strictly increases with theta between 0 and 2 pi. So S star, let us denote S star to be the subclass of S consisting of all the univalent function with respect to the origin. So the special subclass of S star is a class of uh, star-like functions of order alpha, which is nothing but the real part of Z f dash of Z by f of Z is greater than alpha. So this is a star-like function. So the next one uh, is the class of a convex function. So we say that the domain is said to be a convex function if the line segment joining any two points, uh, the line segment joining any two points should lie entirely in D. Suppose if you consider uh, any disk, and if you consider uh, two points, it should lie within the region. Then we can say that it is a convex region. That is a line segment joining any two points. Suppose if you call the points to be, say, some A and B, so the line segment joining any two points should lie entirely in D. Then we say that it is a 
convex uh, domain. That is, uh, if z1 and z2 are any two points, then you can say that lambda z1 plus 1 minus lambda into z2 belongs to D whenever z1 and z2 belongs to D. So a function is said to be convex in the open unit disk, it is univalent and f of e is nothing but the convex domain. So the necessary and sufficient condition uh, for the convex uh, domain is uh, the real part of 1 plus z f double dash of z by f dash of z is greater than 0. So this is a condition for the uh, convex domain. So the geometrical uh, meaning behind this is that is uh, f of r e power i theta maps the circle mod z equal to r less than 1 onto the simply closed contour whose tangents rotates monotonically as the theta increases in the counterclockwise direction. And similarly, the convex of order alpha is denoted by c of alpha, which is nothing but the real part of 1 plus z f double dash of z by f dash of z, which is greater than 0. So this is a geometrical interpretation of the convex functions. So actually, this is a unit disk. So the uh, this is the convex domain and this is the star-like domain. Okay, so the convex domain, if you consider any two points that lie entirely in that region, so that is a convex domain. So we can say that the convex domain is contained in the star-like domain. So the star-like domain is denoted as a star and the convex domain is denoted as K. So the convex domain, the convex function, uh, the family of convex function will be contained in the star-like function which is contained in the class S. So the class S is nothing but the class of all analytic univalent function. So now uh, we will see about the subordination. So the subordination is nothing but if you have a class uh, A, so let uh, the class A is nothing but the class of all analytic function. So it denotes the class of function which are uh, analytic in the unit disk. And if S denote the subclass of A that is univalent in E that is in the unit disk and if F and G or the analytic function we say that F is subordinate to G if there exists a Schwarz function such that this condition is satisfied. That is mod omega of Z is less than 1 for all Z belongs to the unit disk and F of Z equal to G of omega of Z. So this is a condition for the subordination. So these are the important consequences of the subordination. That is, we say that F of F is subordinate to G in E. Uh, so, this are the, uh, this conditions follows. That is, F dash of 0 mod F dash of 0 is less than or equal to mod G dash of 0. And the maximum of F of Z is less than or equal to G of Z. And the real part of F of Z is less than or equal to maximum of the real part of F of Z. And the real part of F of Z is greater than or equal to the minimum of the real part of G of Z. So next, uh, we will come to the Hankel determinant. So the Hankel determinant, actually in 1966, uh, the Pomeranke, um, great mathematician, stated the Q the Hankel determinant for Q greater than or equal to 1 and uh, N greater than or equal to 1 as follows. So this is a, a, a Q the Hankel determinant. So we have this, so the coefficients of the Taylor series, A n, A n plus 1, etc. So A n, A n plus 1, etc. A n plus Q minus 1. And then the next one will start from a n plus 1 and so on. And uh, the next uh, row will start from a n plus 2 and so on, and etc. So the last row will be a n plus q minus 1, etc. a n plus 2 of q minus 1. So this is the Hankel determinant. And currently, many active research are uh, going under this topic. So uh, if you put n equal to 2 and q equal to 2, so we will get the second Hankel determinant. That is h2 of 2. So if you put n equal to 2, you will be getting a2 and then a3. Q is also 2. So uh, 4 minus 1 is 3. So you will be getting a2, a3. And in the second row, you will be getting a3. And the next row, the last one is a n plus 2 of q minus 1. So which is nothing but a4. So this is a 2 by 2 determinant. So which is nothing but the second Hankel determinant. It is a2, a3 and then a3, a4. So this determinant has uh, been considered by the several authors and uh, the bounds are estimated for this uh, second Hankel. And similarly, one can also define the third Hankel and then the fourth Hankel determinant. So third Hankel means, again, you have to substitute n equal to uh, 3. So you will be getting a1, a2, a3. And in the second row, you will be getting a2, a3, a4. And in the third row, you will be getting a3, a4, and then a5. 
So here a1 is nothing but the coefficient. That is, uh, generally we will be consider the function f of z equal to z plus summation a n z power n, where n ranges from 2 to infinity. Right? So in the, uh, that is, the function starts from, that is a z plus a2 z square plus a3 z cube and so on. Right, so these are the coefficients a2, a3, etc. So here a1 is 1, right? So in the, the uh, that is a1, a1, the value of a1 will be always 1. So now if you expand this determinant, you will be getting a3 into a2 minus a, a2, a4 minus a3 square, and similarly minus a4 into a4 minus a2, a3 plus a5 into uh, a3 minus a2 square. So this is the third Hankel determinant. And by using the triangle inequality, this can also be written as like this. That is modulus of a3 and mod of this functional plus mod a4 and mod of the a4 minus a2, a3 and then plus mod a5 into mod a3 minus a2 square. So in order to find the bound for a, the third Hankel, so one need to calculate a3 and then this functional, etc. Right? So for this, we'll, we can apply the Biberbach uh, theorem and the uh, conjecture and then we can uh, find the bounds for the third hankle. So, so far the sharp upper bounds are found only for the second hankle and finding the sharp upper bound for the third hankle, it remains a uh, open problem. So now uh, uh, the, uh, they are finding the bounds for the fourth hankle determinant also. So in the same hankle determinant, if you put n equal to two and two equal to one, you will be getting the inequality uh, a3 minus mu a2 squared. So this is nothing but the fikati zero inequality, right? So in the same Hankel determinant, you have to put q equal to 2 and n equal to 1. So that you will be getting a3 minus mu a2 square. So this is nothing but the fikati zero inequality, one of the famous uh, functional. Uh, we will solve one problem uh, under this uh, second Hankel uh, determinant. So suppose uh, if you are given a uh, function, uh, say some class s a star of phi s t. So how to find the upper bound uh, for this class? So first you have to uh, define the function, which is that s a star of phi s t. So this is a, a Schwarz, that is a Sakakuchi type of function. That is s minus t into z f dash of z divided by f of s z minus f of t z uh, is subordinate to uh, omega of z. So that can be written like this, s minus t into z f dash of z divided by f of s z minus t z equal to phi of omega of t uh, z, where s is not equal to t. So to solve this, first we have to consider uh, the p1, that is which is an analytic function, and uh, p1 of 0 equal to 0, and you can write uh, this p1 z as a power series expansion like this, 1 plus c1 z, c2 z squared, etc. So from this function, if you simplify, you can get the value for omega of z. So, and, uh, and then by comparing these two equations, we can get the value for the coefficients b1, b2, etc. Right? So, since this is univalent, you can expand this, phi of omega of z. Actually, we have defined what is p is it. So, p, p1 of z is nothing but 1 plus c1 is it, c2 is it squared, etc. And now we know uh, what is omega of z. So just by substituting in this, you will be getting this series. So by substituting and simplifying, you will be getting this series. So now you can equate these two uh, terms. So if you equate these two terms, you can find the coefficients of a2, a4, that is uh, the Taylor's coefficients. So after finding the coefficients, we can find the upper bound. So on equating uh, the coefficients, you can find the values for a2, a3, and a4. Right? So from this, you can find the upper bound for the function by uh, applying the triangle inequality and by substituting the value for C2 and C3, one can find the upper bound for the function. So these are some of the calculations I have done. So here uh, by applying the calculus, we can find the upper bound. That is here for this problem, we got the upper bound to be b1 square divided by 3 minus s square minus st minus t square the whole square. So uh, uh, to find the extremal problem, that is uh, to find the uh, sharp uh, uh, function, we can consider the 
rotation of the Kobe function. As I said earlier, the Kobe function serves as an external problem for all the uh, functions of the class S. So if you consider the function 1 minus uh, uh, z plus z by 1 minus z the whole squared, we'll be getting 1 plus 2 z squared, etc. So the result is sharp for the function s minus t, so which is equal to phi of z and which is equal to phi of z squared. So these are the recent trends in the geometric uh, function theory. That is uh, univalent function in the frequency analysis and then univalent function in anamorphism. Actually, this is applied in almost all the fields, not only in the pure mathematics, but also in the um, applied mathematics and also in different branches of science. So, and then the quantum calculus. So, all the things are actively, many research are going under this topic. Uh, so, first uh, we will uh, see some introduction about this anamorphism. So, actually this uh, anamorphism, anamorphosis is nothing but a specific technique of a geometric projection of a shape on a surface. So, the method of producing a distorted image that appears normal by viewing it through a curved mirror or uh, from an unusual angle. So, that is nothing but the anamorphosis. So, this was actually studied by the painters in the 15th and the 16th century as they were trying to understand the perspective. So, that is, uh, you can say, you can uh, see this uh, image. That is in the modern times, anamorphosis, anamorphosis has uh, continued to be used. That is, in this diagram, you can say that the cylindrical mirror is placed on the top. You can see this. The cylindrical mirror is placed on the uh, top of the sun and the image of the author. Okay, so that is uh, displayed here. So, this is one of the anamorphosis used here. So, the image is uh, clear until the dryer, until uh, uh, you can say that uh, this is actually the author of uh, this. The mirror is placed in the top of this. So, this is anamorphism uh, study. So, these are my uh, references. So, if you have any questions, I can take that. Is any questions from the participants? Participants, any question from your side? So I see only one comment that a good explanation on univalent functions. That is by Jayalakshmi. Other than that, I think. You can Thank post you. your questions in the chat box um, or otherwise uh, um, I would like to thank Madam for giving us uh, a wonderful lecture on introduction to geometric function theory and um, uh, thanks a lot Madam for your wonderful thank lecture. Thank you sir. I, I, I am sure this will give some innovative ideas as well as new uh, uh, dimension in terms of geometric function theory and other things. Um, uh, thanks a lot uh, for your wonderful presentation. And tomorrow we will have a webinar series on mathematical transforms. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir.